everybody and welcome to Podversations, the new lecture podcast format powered by the University of East London, where two academics discuss the latest trends in communication and media transformations. My name is Valentina Signorelli, I'm the course leader for the BA Media and Communication at the University of East London, and I'm also a transmedia director and producer. So today, this episode will focus on deconstructing anti-vax theories, and please let me introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Marco Toffoli, neurologist and doctoral researcher at University College London. Welcome, Marco. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Okay, before we start, Marco, a little disclaimer for those who are not only listening to us, but also watching our podcast on, on YouTube. As you can see, guys, we are not wearing any masks and we are less than one meter apart, which is pretty unusual and also illegal, I would say. But this is because we actually live under the same roof and we are each other's support bubble. Uh, for this episode, I was actually inspired by one of my BA students who recorded a podcast with her boyfriend in Term 1. And I thought it was a brilliant idea. And I also thought that I wanted to invite you today, Marco, to share your expertise um, and help me deconstruct the main anti-vax theories together today. So before we start, as usual, as usual, I normally ask my, uh, my guests to, to introduce themselves and tell us a bit more about their background. So could you please tell us a bit more about yourself, your background, what did you study, what are you doing right now, and why you became interested in today's topic? Yeah, so I'm a medical doctor and a neurologist. I did uh, my training in Italy, six years of medical training, then one year of foundation and four years of specialty training. And then I moved to London to do a PhD in neurosciences. I focus mainly on Parkinson's disease, but uh, which is not really the topic of today's conversation. But uh, during the pandemic, I was forced to stop my research because all our equipment was taken for testing on, for COVID and for uh, trial purposes. And uh, so I decided to volunteer and I worked in a COVID ward at the Royal Free Hospital. And I also volunteered for two different trials on vaccines for uh, COVID-19 one by Oxford and AstraZeneca, and another one by Imperial College London. So let's move on to defining our key terms for, for today. And I would say that vaccine is the main key term to um, discuss what are anti-vax theories later on. So as, usually, as usual, I um, took a look at the Oxford Dictionary, uh, just to have an idea on what is the mainstream meaning of vaccine. And I'm quoting from the Oxford Dictionary, uh, a vaccine is a substance used to stimulate the production of antibodies and provide immunity against one or several diseases. Um, prepared from the causative agent of a disease, its products, or a synthetic substitute treated to act as an antigen without inducing um, the disease. There are many and uh, plenty of publications about uh, the, the history of human vaccines and vaccinations in general. And one of the uh, most comprehensive and even very simple and clear to understand is Lombard's A Brief History of Vaccines and Vaccinations, um, in which we could see that um, some rudimental forms of vaccine and vaccinations are um, do not do not belong exclusively to the modern times, but it's something that it's been part of the human knowledge across different communities around the world for a long, long time. So I'm quoting from a brief history of vaccines and vaccinations. Um, the inoculation of serous fluid under the skin is a procedure that has long been known as a way of protecting flocks against sheep pox. In particular, there is, a docu there is documentary evidence of its use by nomadic herders in Africa, for example, among the Tulani. There can be no doubt that this practice must have drawn attention to the possibility of acquiring protection from serious disease by contracting a form of the disease that was attenuated to a greater or lesser extent. In earlier times, people were closer to, the, to their animals and animal farmers often had the reputation among neighboring town folk of being healers. Yet it is difficult to know whether it was inoculation with the sheep, sheep pox that had led to the idea of human variolation or vi vice versa. It may seem more logical to favor the first hypothesis. However, even if inoculation against sheep pox was mentioned by explorers in Africa as long as the 16th century, it is highly likely that human variolation was attempted in China or India even before then. 
And with variolation, we mean uh, inoculation first used to immunize individuals against smallpox, uh, whose uh, Latin term is variola, with material taken from a patient or a recent, recently variolated individual in the hope that a mild but protective infection would result. Uh, then one of the main um, turning point in, in human medicine in, in general and in the history of vaccine and vaccination is 1796, when British doctor Edward Jenner observed that, that milkmaids were generally immune to smallpox and postulated that the pus, the pus in the blister that milkmaids received from cowpox protected them from smallpox. He concluded that getting infected with a relatively mild cowpox virus conferred immunity against the deadly smallpox virus, which was definitely deadlier. And in fact, the, the English word vaccine comes from the Latin word vacca, which means cow, and its adject adjective vaccino, uh, normally used to indicate cow milk. So this is a very <laughs> long introduction, but Marco, why, um, why do you think gender discovery is a turning point for the history of medicine? And what is the difference between um, that type of vaccination forms and contemporary uh, vaccines, including the COVID-19 ones that you've worked on? Yeah, so thank you for the introduction, <laughs> which was very comprehensive. Um, well, for once, one may think about the death toll of smallpox. In the past, uh, in the last 100 years of its, its existence, it is estimated that smallpox killed over 500 million people, uh, which is possibly one of the main causes of death in humanity uh, by all causes. So the fact that smallpox doesn't exist anymore in nature because of the vaccine is by itself a huge achievement of medicine, I would say. Um, but there's not only that, uh, there are many other examples. For example, polio. Uh, polio was a main uh, health issue in the beginning of the 1900s, for example. And it's now, it's not eradicated, but it's almost eradicated. We don't hear or see any uh, result of infections at the moment. So I think this is another huge achievement. There are now, uh, I think it was 78 when the WHO established his program to vaccine all children against uh, the most common and uh, uh, most deadly diseases, including tetanus, um, weeping cough, um, hemophilus 1B, one of the causes of meningitis, for example. And by the 80s, most of the population was vaccine and these diseases uh, went from being one of the main causes of death and disability in children to becoming almost eradicated. So I would say that there is no doubt that uh, vaccines are one of the biggest achievements in the history of medicine. Now, one other example that I think is very important is measles. Measles is very similar to smallpox for a lot of different reasons. And it was actually the next target for eradication by the, by the WHO. Unfortunately, and I guess this is what we will talk about in a minute, um, in part because of the anti-vax movement, uh, this goal was not achieved and actually the rates of vaccinations against measles are dropping uh, as we speak. Uh, in terms of the new vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, uh, these constitute possibly the biggest uh, progress in terms of vaccinations of the past 20 years. What is the difference? Usually a vaccine is a uh, part of a pathogen, a virus or a bacteria that is uh, inoculated to, uh, into our body so that our immune system can develop a defense against it. Uh, without posing any risk for our health because uh, the, um, the, what we inoculate is not the actual pathogen, so we won't get any disease from it. Um, with M mRNA vaccines, uh, the, the story changes. We, we're not inoculating any part of the virus. We are actually inoculating the information that is needed by our body to produce that part. So to be, to be clearer, we inoculate some RNA, which is a type of genetic molecule, into our body, and our cells will produce the proteins that then the uh, our immune ce immune cells will 
uh, develop a immune response against. Uh, why this is so important? Because uh, it's a lot easier to design and a lot faster to create than um, than the the normal vaccines that we used in the past. So it's we we saw this with this pandemic because we were able to develop a vaccine uh, in a record time. I would say something that was not possible, for example, with the cholera outbreak just a few years ago. And it's important for future um, future um, pandemics and future diseases as well, because we will be able to create a vaccine against anything that might come up in the future a lot quicker than we are now. Okay, thank you very much, Marco, for providing this overview. Um, so today is Saturday, 6th of February, 2021, and... My students will possibly listen to this podcast in less than a week. Mm -hmm. So the most recent statistics about the UK vaccination program relates to the um, to last week. So to the week ending by January 31st, with over eight million, eight and a half million people vaccinated with at least the first job. And with several news agencies, including, for example, The Guardian reporting, and I quote them more, that actually more than 11.4 million people have had their first vaccine dose, which means that possibly uh, tomorrow or in a couple of days, as soon as the NHS will, will release the latest weekly statement, we will see more than 11 million people in the UK having um having been vaccinated, at least with the first job. Uh, on the other hand, um, today, on Saturday, the 6th of February 2021, there are still 828 correlated deaths um, for COVID-related calls that have been registered. So um, it, it's interestingly enough, when it, we talk about, when we talk about anti, anti-vax theories, or the uh, media power of promoting the right information or spreading fake news. Um, it's important to take a look also at the death rates, but not only at the, at the death rates, but more specifically to the um, differences in how the virus might be affecting some communities in the UK, among others, and whether part of these uh, differences are um, correlated to genetic aspects or to inequalities in the system, in the healthcare systems, or a combination of different factors. So possibly one of the most important reports that have been published um, in relation to COVID statistics is the one that was published by the Office for National Statistics in May 2020, which showed that in the UK, Black women are 4.3 times more likely to die from coronavirus than their white counterparts. Uh, with black men standing at 4.2 times, uh, followed by Pakistani, the Pakistani Bangladeshi communities, which have 3.6 more, uh, that are 3.6 more likely um, to die from, from COVID than their white counterparts, and this is for men, whereas women still stand at 3.4. Um, then the Indian community with 2.4 times more likely to die from coronavirus that their white counterparts for men and 2.7 for, for women. And even people with a mixed background in the UK are 1.6 and 1.8 more likely to die from COVID-19 than their white counterparts. Um, so these, these are the uh, statistics about the UK populations re registered and released in um, May 2020. Uh, on the other hand, a recent poll by the Royal Society for Public Health that was published a few weeks ago in December 2020 has shown um, that, and I'm quoting now from the uh, Society's press release, that only 50% of respond respondents from Black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds in the UK, and there were 199 respondents, we're likely to accept the COVID-19 vaccine compared to the 79% of white counterparts. Confidence was lowest, especially among respondents of Asian ethnicity, of whom 55% were likely to say yes, which means that 43% of BAME respondents were skeptical about the vaccine, opposite to the 21%. Of white respondents. The most encouraging element from this report, however, comes from uh, the BAME community and the BAME communities in, in London, where over a third 
of those who were skeptical about receiving the vaccine. And particularly, I'm talking about 35% of these people who were skeptical uh, about the vaccine said they would like to change their mind and get a job if they were given more information about their GP, about how effective the vaccine is, um, and almost twice as many as the 18% of white people who were initially willing. So the, this report in synthesis shows that the confidence in the healthcare system and in particularly in the scientific community and in the vaccine is lowest at lowest among people of Black, Asian and minority background, who are, however, the most hit communities by COVID-19. Uh, whereas there is still a confidence in their local GP if uh, the uh, if accurate information is provided um, to them. So if we think about the origin of uh, skepticism in or lack of confidence in the healthcare system or in the scientific community in general uh, from ethnic minorities in the UK or in general and around the world, this might be rooted in, in different circumstances. If we think, for example, at the importance that Black Lives Matter's protests had uh, in 2020 in highlighting, for example, um, for example, to rewrite the history of modern gynecology, uh, which is actually rooted in exploitation and extend experimentation, experimentation on African-American women rather than from a white male uh, centered perspective that, show, that shows how um, a consistent part of medical progress is and derives and was caused or achieved through human suffering and exploitation of ethnic minorities. Um, this is just an example from the history of gyneco gyneco gynecology, <laughs> sorry, between the uh, 18th and 19th century, but there are there is a legacy in structural racism or what is called implicit bias in medicine nowadays. And there are a number of interesting studies highlighting uh, the origins of inequality or structural racism in contemporary, in contemporary medicine. I am quoting, for example, or mentioning, for example, a study by Hoffman Italia, which is called Racial Bias in Pain Assessment and Treatment Recommendation and False Beliefs about Biological Differences Between Blacks and Whites. This is a 2016 study, and it, most, it was mostly relating to American patients and doctors. However, that's the first uh, study that highlighted an evidence that racial bias in pain perception is associated with racial bias in pain treat treatment recommendations, which in, simple, in simpler terms means that the overwhelming majority or the, the biggest percentage of medical doctors comes from a white background, are white, um, and sometimes they underestimate the actual pain <laughs> that some patients might feel, and there is a lack of direct communication between patients and doctors, which might result in lack of confidence in the healthcare systems or the scientific community. Um, so in the light of this, Marco, what can you tell us about, you know, this phenomenon, implicit biases, uh, from your own experience during the trial? And what is your uh, view about the skepticism from non-white communities in the UK? Very big and different, difficult questions. I'm yeah. That. <laughs> so there's a lot to cover here. Um, regarding the bias in research toward the um, ethnic minorities, that's a, a huge problem. Uh, we, you know, that we sequence the human genome, for example. Well, we sequence the white human genome. I would say that we have very poor information about genetic uh, background of people of African ancestry, for example. Uh, and this causes a bias when uh, new medications are designed, when uh, the decisions are made that relate to global health, for example. And uh, why is that? I, I don't know. There are theories, though. Uh, I think that the main problem is that research is very expensive and needs to be funded. And um, and so the the countries where research takes place is countries that are uh, wealthy, and in most cases this coincide with countries where the majority of people are of white background. Um, 
although this is changing, but keep in mind that by in 30 years, uh, 43% of the expenses on research will be in uh, Southeast Asia and in particular in China. So we might see a huge change there. But at the moment, the situation is that uh, white people are privileged in, uh, in their taking part in research. But this is only part of the uh, problem because uh, even if we take uh, wealthy countries that are leaders in medical research, for example, the UK or the United States of America, um, they have a big component of non-white uh, minorities in their population. But these minorities don't take part in research as much as the, uh, the white people do. Why is that? Uh, there, there must be a component of lack of trust uh, from these minorities toward uh, the research and medicine and the establishment in general. We know, for example, that uh, some ethnic minorities vote less uh, during elections in the US than, they, uh, than their white counterpart do. Um, and so this definitely plays a role. And there are histori historical reasons here, as you mentioned, exploitation of uh, um, different minorities uh, for a medical research and, uh, and so on. I think there's also a problem of communication because uh, re research, to, to recruit participants, you need to inform them and then conv convince them to take part in a trial. And uh, the drug companies spend a huge amount of money in communication, in designing leaflets, patient information sheets, and, uh, and in training people on how to, uh, to inform po possible potential uh, participants. Uh, I think this communication is a bit skewed toward uh, the uh, white audience, and this definitely uh, can cause some problems there. Um, and then finally, uh, it's well known that some ethnic minorities have less access to healthcare and uh, hospitals are where uh, people are recruited for trials. So if uh, a particular minority goes less to hospital for any reason, they will be less likely to be recruited for trials. I think all these things together and possibly others contribute to making a uh, non-white ethnic minority minorities less represented in research. And I can give you my personal yeah, please, please. Um, experience. Uh, when I was working for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine uh, at the University College Hospital in Houston, uh, we invited all uh, staff or doctors, nurses, uh, porters, all people that worked in the hospital to take part in research. We wanted people that worked in a hospital because they, are at, they were at higher risk of being exposed to coronavirus. And so it was easier for us to assess the effectiveness of the vaccine. Um, so we invite, invited everybody, but only 0.7% of people that turned up were uh, black, for example, despite, uh, despite staff in, at UCH having a lot of non-white people working. Why is that? I don't really know what we already discussed, plus possibly the fact that uh, the majority of people that uh, responded to our call were actually medical doctors. And uh, it's true that uh, non a lot of non-white people work in the hospital, but doctors are mainly white. And why is that, in your opinion, in the UK? Again, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, medical studies are very expensive here. Uh, in Italy, I paid uh, less than two thousand pounds per year for my me th throughout my medical uh, studies, and if uh, for people that whose families could not afford that, uh, studying was free. While here, if you want to become a medical doctor, you have to spend a crazy amount of money. Or get to, a loan. Or so get a loan, which that. is still spending a lot of money. You <laughs> just spend it later, you know. So. Um, I think that in the end, possibly the explanation for this particular case of the AstraZeneca trial, uh, the, the reason is that uh, mostly doctors were responding to the call and uh, doctors are uh, mostly white in the UK.
Still. <laughs> Still. Okay. Thank you for that. So if we move on to assessing the main uh, topic for today, which is um, anti-vax groups and anti-vax theories, um, the, it, it's worth to remember that the World Health Organization ha- considers uh, vaccine hes- hesitancy to be one of the top 10 risks to, bo- to global public health, which means that spreading misinformation or, the, uh, or having some large groups or, of people thinking that vaccines are not affecting or are, are a threat, or there is a big con- conspiracy behind that, that's one of the main threats uh, to global public health. So it's not just related to the healthiest or richest communities or the poorest communities around the world, but this is something that in- interconnects and connects everyone around the globe. So um, when I was looking for more information about the presence of anti-vax groups in the UK, I was quite used to the Italian ones, possibly from my own experience. So it was the first time that I was actually taking a look in more depth at what is the situation in the UK, and especially because these groups use social media as the main way to recruit participants and to reinforce um, their own thoughts and their own propaganda. Uh, I came up. Um, I came up to this um, report, this research that was published by the Center for Countering Digital Hate (CCDH). For those interested in taking a look at their websites, um, so this report estimates that there are 5.35 million UK followers of anti-vaccination accounts across social media, with Facebook and YouTube as the main uh, social media that are used. Um, And this is already interesting if we think about the prevalence of 40 plus, 45 plus uh, people using Facebook and YouTube as their main social media during the day compared to younger um, groups and younger audiences that mainly use, I don't know, Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok. The second interesting aspect is that these groups are primarily targeting parents and people from ethnic minorities in the UK. This is particularly interesting if we already see an implicit bias or a structural bias in the healthcare system. And most importantly, uh, there might be another element for reinforcement coming from social media and digital media in, gen- uh, in general or online communities spreading misinformation uh, that are specifically targeting um, some people and some communities in, in the country. On the other hand, as we could see this summer, for example, besides the online activities, this group, these groups also held a number of protests in the UK and in London in particular over the summer. Um, And the interesting feature there is that the overwhelming majority of participants, physical participants, uh, look white or are white and white passing. And they were not wearing any masks or not uh, complying with social distancing rule. So on the one hand, we have ethnic minorities being the main target online and uh, a consistent number of white people attending physical protests. Uh, when they happened. Um, so there is an interesting a- article by Balogway and McComas, which has been published, which was published on public health in 2021, which quotes, uh, since the start of the pandemic, the largest anti-vax social media accounts have gained more than 70, 7.8 million followers worldwide and increased of 19% since 2019. This has triggered the UK government and social media platforms to agree a package of measures to reduce online vaccine disinformation, including the labeling of posts marked as untrue by third party fact checkers. So again, this is an article that doesn't uh, focus exclusively on the UK, but considers it considers the situation worldwide. Anti-vax groups, for example, um, are not and are not an, an exclusive, exclusively UK phenomenon. It's actually a worldwide phenomenon. Um, but then the UK government, among other governments in the world, has decided to t- trying to tackle this phenomenon by um, using countermeasures on online. Uh, so using fact checks 
fact check um, tools and and so on. Um, and this is particularly important if we want to address uh, the links between social media strategies and these type of communication styles with the main fake news that are being uh, spread by, by these groups, trying to find or to, to close the gap between what science is proving and what people are believing uh, without necessarily judging all the concerns that people might have, which are pretty reasonable, but in an attempt to trying to find a way to, um, to spread the right type of information. So um, this report shows that in relation to COVID-19, anti-vaxxers in general make three big claims that are the main three types of messages contained in their social media activities. And these three topics are actually the same across the world, the same across different countries. So the first claim is COVID is not dangerous. And I would like you, I would like you, Marco, to, to comment on these claims with some evidence in order to unpack and deconstruct this series. So first one, COVID is not dangerous. Yeah, thank you, Valentina. I think um, you said one very important thing in that uh, people have the right, all the rights in the world, to be concerned about uh, the vaccine, about the safety of the vaccine. Uh, I mean, they're, they're being told to get a job of something that other people are, tell, are telling them are gonna is going to be very harmful or, heavy, or even deadly. So I think it's understandable that people have uh, concerns. The, the way to make uh, a decision for the vaccine, as with any decision, I guess, is to weigh pros and cons. In this case, uh, risks from infection and risks from the vaccine and decide what outweighs what. Uh, so we all know how many people are reported to be dead because of COVID-19 in the UK and around the world. Uh, some anti-vaxxers say that the main problem with that is that the, the numbers report all people that died with COVID, not because of COVID. Most people were old and had other diseases and uh, would have died anyway. I think the best way to look into whether this is true or not is to look at the mortality rate for the COVID period and the same period in the previous years. So there is a very nice paper published by our uh, Italian friends in Lombardy that looked at, you know, that Lombardy was the epicenter of the first wave of the European pandemic. Yeah, it's the same wave in which I, I lost three relatives in my, my family. Some of my students know it already, but yeah, that's the region where I'm from. Indeed. And uh, so in the period between March and April 2020, more than four times as many people died as in the same period in the pre previous five years. Just to give you an example, in uh, some uh, particular cities like Bergamo, for example, in uh, the years previous to 2020, around 200 people died each day. While in, sorry, in Lom this is the figure for all, all the whole of the region. In 2020, over 800 people died each day in the same period. So you can clearly see that more people were dying. And the only difference really is that there was COVID. So that's one thing that I think it's clear that coronavirus is deadly and caused many deaths and will cause more deaths in the future. The second thing is that um, many people say, well, I'm not, uh, I, I'm younger than 50. I am healthy, so I have nothing to worry about. I will probably get an asymptomatic infection and carry on with my life. This is, Partly true, I mean, if we disregard the fact that these people might still infect elderly people and cause their death, which is, uh, is a very serious thing by itself, there are more and more evidence, there is more and more evidence uh, accumulating on the long-term effect of coronavirus. And keep in mind that no one uh, had coronavirus for more than a year in the world yet we, yet yeah. so we don't know what uh, the virus may cause but what we know is that for example the virus can grow in neurons 
And uh, as I mean, the, the, the main example is that m many people with coronavirus will lose their sense of smell and taste. So this is neurons not working properly because of the infection. Um, and I had a personal experience. Now, now we know that the, there are many neurological implications of people with COVID, even of people with that don't require hospitalization because of uh, respiratory problems. For example, I had a personal experience with one 52-year-old uh, um, man, man from uh, the Congo who um, presented because of uh, confusion. He was not right uh, with the words of uh, his wife. Um, he didn't have any other symptoms, no fever, no respiratory problems. So he did a test like everybody in the hospital and he was found to have coronavirus. He was kept in the hospital for a while. And after uh, two to three days, uh, a scan of the head was done. And we found that he had uh, two uh, bleedings in the, in the brain. Um, and these bleedings were possibly caused by coronavirus. There is evidence uh, showing that uh, a cerebral vasculitis or uh, an encephalitis can be caused by coronavirus. This still, we still need to understand this. I'm not saying this is all um, uh, common knowledge yet, but we are studying it and it sounds like we st we're still seeing the tip of the iceberg in terms of how much uh, harm the, the virus can do to our and body. And this is just to your own field, neurology, but yes. I'm sure that there are many other colleagues in other fields that are looking and, in, and are currently investigating the effects, the long-term effects um, of COVID besides the respiratory um, yeah. disease that might appear in other fields. Uh, besides neurology, for example. Yeah, so for example, uh, another tissue where the virus grows, and this has been observed already, uh, is the endothelium, which is the inner part of our uh, blood vessels. And this in turn can cause a vasculitis, which can affect the kidneys, can affect the testes, the brain, again, anything. And finally, we also know that uh, many people that have a asymptomatic coronavirus infection show scars or lesions on chest x-ray, even younger people. And these people will have the scar which will, pose, which will make them at a higher risk of uh, uh, subsequent pulmonary infections, for example. So saying that COVID is not dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I would say this is really a, an understatement to say that, I mean, it's not true, it's not dangerous. Okay, thank you for your first reply. So the second big claim that anti-vaxxers around the world make is vaccines are dangerous. Okay, yes, vaccines have side effects. Uh, the, and people should know about them when they decide whether to get vaccinated. Um, the most common side effects are what I'll call the reactogenicity uh, effects. Uh, what does it mean? It means that when we inject the virus, the, the virus, the vaccine, uh, our immune system will, will mount a response, which in part will be an inflammatory response. This is the natural uh, way of uh, developing uh, immunity against something. Um, the inflammation can be seen in uh, locally where we inject the vaccine. So for example, uh, the, the site of injection might be swollen or slightly painful or can be systemic, like, uh, for example, developing a fever. These are normal effects of the vaccines. They're very common, for example, with the seasonal flu vaccine. Um, and um, these are not worrying. They go away very quickly. They happen, uh, depends on the vaccine, with the coronavirus vaccines. I think it's one every three people. Uh, one can take paracetamol, for example. I think these are not very important side effects. There are more severe side, side effects. effects. Um, for example, and now I'm quoting the study for, uh, by Pfizer, uh, where 21,720 people received the uh, vaccine, while another 21,000 received the placebo. Uh, there were four related serious adverse events reported uh, among the people that received the actual vaccine. So four out of 21,000 and something. Uh, the uh, serious adverse events were 
shoulder injury related to vaccine administration, which means uh, it's not very clear here, but probably, I mean, you know, there's a needle. It might have caused some cause of in, uh, some sort of injury. There was right axillary lymphadenopathy, which what is... What does it mean? Yeah, it's <laughs> this, an, is very, this is very complex to understand. It's an enlargement of the lymph nodes. Basically, okay. uh, this person reported having a, um, like a small lump on his uh, axilla, and uh, this uh, was apparently painful and big enough to consider the event serious, although all these serious adverse events were um, just uh, transient, they went away. There was another person that had a uh, particular kind of uh, cardiac arrhythmia, which was uh, symptomatic in terms, in, his, in the sense that he could feel his heart, but it was not at all harmful. And the, the last person had some paresthesia, so a, a weird sensation in the right leg. Again, transient, but severe. Uh, in total, and I think this is important to mention, there were two people that died in the uh, arm in the, among the 21,000 that received the uh, vaccine, and four people that died among those that received the placebo, and no death was attributed to the vaccine anyway. Okay. Uh, so these are the, the adverse events that we can expect so far, um, which I would say it's a very, I work in research, so I see different trials, different medications, and this is a very good safety profile for any medication, really. Um, now, what about the long-term, uh, so the, the side effects we know of so far are very few, and I would say are not very concerning. Uh, what about the long-term effects of vaccines? Uh, well, we don't know about this particular vaccine. This is the main weakness of the research because we want, we were in a hurry to, to have the vaccine ready. We didn't uh, prolong the trials for years. Of course, this, this was not feasible in this particular situation. Uh, but we can look at other vaccines. Uh, what are the long-term term effects of other vaccines that we are using already? Um, well, you can be reassured in that uh, there are very few. Actually, there is none that is proved to be a long-term effect of vaccines. Uh, there was a report in 1999, I think, of a higher rate of type 1 diabetes among people that received uh, a particular vaccine. But I think this has never been accepted as conclusive because there was no a case control study and they basically died there. So the, the vaccines are medications that usually don't cause any long-term effect. So thank you for discussing or for explaining the main side effects that have been registered so far with the Pfizer vaccine, um, for example, which I think it's more or less the same type of side effects observed for the other approved vaccines at the moment. Um, just to give an idea of, or to provide a bit of more context when we talk about side effects, is this something that applies exclusively to vaccines or is it something that applies to all medical drugs and particularly to even everyday medical drugs such as paracetamol that you can buy without a prescription, mm -hmm. for example? So that's a very good example, actually, because uh, paracetamol uh, is a medication that almost everybody has taken at least once in their life. Uh, I, I suggest you, you, if you have paracetamol at home, you take the leaflet and read the adverse events. Some of them are very scary and, uh, um, and very severe, very serious. Uh, paracetamol can cause liver failure, for example. Uh, it has been reported to cause to be associated with cardiac arrhythmias, severe cardiac arrhythmias that can cause uh, death in, uh, in the long term. But uh, everybody takes paracetamol and we widely consider it to be a safe drug because it is. It's just that when a clinical trial is done, uh, everything that goes wrong is reported. And if it's not possible to ex to reasonably exclude a, co a relation between the adverse event and the vaccine, uh, sorry, and the medication in general, it will be reported in the leaflet. Okay. So uh, there is one last thing I wanted to say about adverse events and, va and the coronavirus vaccine, which is um, allergic reactions. Allergic reactions are by far the most severe and possibly common side effect that we can expect 
um, from this kind of vaccines. Uh, as with any other vaccine, as with any other medication, every time we take a new medication, there is a possibility that we develop an allergic reaction and allergic reactions to medications are bad. Uh, so that being said, it is very, very rare that it happens. So we know, for example, that in the UK, we already uh, gave at least the first dose of vaccine to over 11 million uh, people and uh, uh, allergic reaction was not an issue. Uh, in any case, people are uh, required to provide a medical history. And if there is any reason to believe that they are, they are at higher risk of, uh, get, of getting an allergic reaction to the vaccine, they will not be offered the vaccine. For example, if they already had allergic reaction to other medications. Uh, at the same time, uh, people will be kept, all people that receive the vaccine will be, will be kept in observation for a small period of time after receiving the vaccine, which is the period of, the, of time where an allergic reaction will uh, happen if it has to. Um, and there will be a doctor with the people that receive the vaccine ready to treat the uh, potential allergic, allergic reaction. So I would say the main um, safety concern is allergic reactions. This is still a very, very low risk and all measures are taken to make sure that um, that uh, it's not dangerous for people. Yeah. And this is why it's so important to communicate with the medical staff in general. So on the one hand, I would say it's important for the patients to ask all the questions that they have to their GP or to their allocated doctor and vice versa. It's a doctor's responsibility to listen to patients regardless of their medical history or um, socioeconomic background or ethnic background. Um, in order to, to optimize this resource that is becoming available uh, for free to the population. Third big claim that the anti-vaxxer community makes is experts cannot be trusted. Right. I'm supposed to be the expert here, right? Yeah, <laughs> at least for today Okay. and in um, our everyday life. I, I think this is a very old problem, probably as old as society. Um, Experts are seen as people in a place of power, and sometimes there might be skepticism against people in a place of power. I think this is only natural. Um, now, the problem is that with the advent of the internet and social media, this has become a more widespread problem. Uh, everybody can say anything on the internet, and all information are uh, offered at the same level. So for example, if I want to find the information supporting uh, my belief that the earth is flat and I, go, I spend 10 minutes on Google, I will find hundreds of websites. Um, so how is how to decide what information is to be trusted and what is not to be trusted? Well, uh, this again is a very old question that the scientific community asked itself. And the answer is the scientific method. What is it? For yeah. those who are not so, familiar with this term. How things were before the scientific method. I would just say, I believe that this thing is true and I explain why this, I believe this is true. And so there were treaties over treaties on uh, scientific theories. Okay, so it's basically in, in a pre-scientific era, I would say human knowledge was built on observation and observing consequences and assuming that... Um, elements were linked to each other for <laughs> unknown reasons. And this type of knowledge is built one upon the other, one element upon the other. So there might be issues in terms of uh, truth <laughs> and evidence of what they have been observed. But what has changed with the scientific method and why we need to trust, do we need to trust the scientific community well, worldwide? Okay, the scientific method consists in uh, uh, coming up with uh, a hypothesis about uh, anything and then uh, figuring out an experiment to prove that the hypothesis is true. And the way to report this experiment, um, the correct way to report it is to provide all information about the methods used to conduct the experiment so that other people around the world can uh, reproduce the same uh, experiment and get the same data or not. Uh, so every time there is a paper with any kind of a scientific uh, discovery, 
there will be a methodology described and other people around the world will actually try to uh, reproduce the experiment. And it has happened in the past that some experiments were not reproduced and so they, the information was considered uh, less uh, trustworthy, for example. This is the core of the scientific method and this is why uh, you can claim anything on the internet, but you need to have proof. You need to conduct an experiment. Otherwise, it's just words. Okay. And what about uh, the peer review process, which is something that um, some of my students might be aware of as they are in university, but most people um, who are not familiar with the scientific method or the academic world, are, uh, they don't know what it is. What is the peer review process? So the, the way to report any kind of scientific discovery is to write a paper and submit it to a journal, like, for example, The Lancet, Nature. Are the most famous. These are the science. most famous yeah. ones in medical research. Um, when the paper is submitted, it will go through the process of peer review, which is uh, the paper will be sent to some other uh, researchers, investigators around the world. That are not related to the same university. That are not related to the same university and that uh, the researcher will not know about. So if I submit a paper, the, the, the journal will decide who to send it to. It will mostly be random or semi-random and I will not have any power to control who is it sent yeah. to. But these people, of course, they know are experts in the, that field. It of doesn't course. happen that you have no. a person with a major in philosophy that's peer reviewing something that it's... It's other uh, investigators. Trial. Yeah. Of course, of course. It's people <laughs> that are supposed to have yeah, the knowledge. Yeah, people who to... have like studied. They have yeah. studied for a while. And uh, these people, uh, there are usually at least two different uh, peer reviewers, will uh, read the paper write down their opinion and ask questions about things that are not clear. Opinions or concerns. Or concerns, about, exactly. About like, the methodology, whether it's being conducted in the right way. Ethical concerns as well, of course, which is a major thing yeah, in and, science. And we'll decide whether the paper is to be trusted and whether it's deemed appropriate to be published so that the scientific community will know about it. Uh, so this is the first uh, line of... Con of uh, fact checking in, in science. The second one, of course, is as I was mentioning that each experiment needs to be reproducible. So if I claim something, it, I go through peer review and it is accepted, but then 10 other people do the same experiment and find something else, then my results will still be discarded in the end by the scientific community. Yeah, and this this is for my students. It happens the same e even for even with humanities and media studies. Anytime you submit a paper for consideration, you will be assessed or your paper will be assessed by two independent um, scholars, possibly in different parts of the world that are going to comment on your work. And especially, which is the most important part, uh, most important part, they will be commenting on your methodology to check whether the process you have used to come up with the results is actually credible <laughs> and ethical most of the times. So yeah, this is, doesn't only happen to science. It happens to any form of uh, data collection and data manipulation and processing. But that's most important for medical research because it's based most of the times on human samples and human participants. And finally, I wanted to add that, um, yes, uh, the one can just go to the papers published by all the, the scientific journals and read everything to form an opinion on a particular problem. But we know this is not realistic for uh, many of us. So, and this is where experts actually come into play. Experts can be uh, organizations, can be scientists, can be journals. Um, these people will read the papers for you and transform the digest the information and provide it to the general public mm -hmm. so that the general public can understand it. And this is why uh, experts are important. I can read about how to treat cancer from uh, eatwell.co.ru, but uh, it, probably the information will be more accurate if I get them from the WHO website. Yeah, or the sense. UK government, NHS, for example. That's another good source of information from basic uh, information and medical information, then it's, of course, it's always important to talk to your GP and talk to your doctor because every person is different if you have concerns about a specific disease. Indeed. Uh, 
you are not supposed to read everything about a particular condition, medical condition you might have, but doctors are supposed to. So if you go to your doctor, he's supposed to have read everything. Okay, <laughs> good point. Okay, Marco, thank you very much for unpacking three of the main claims that antibiotics make. Uh, I have a couple of final questions. The first one is that what do you think could be improved to reach out to people from different backgrounds and encourage them to take part in trials, participate in trials, or even to pursue a medical career in general? So again, I'm not an expert in communication, but I think uh, uh, increased inclusivity in communication campaigns is uh, paramount to achieve a better uh, involvement of uh, some particular communities in research, uh, providing more information to some particular communities is important. Uh, we, we were talking about experts. I think experts are too often identified as uh, the professor or the, the privileged per person. I think it's important that even experts represent uh, people from all backgrounds, rich, poor, um, white, non-white, anything really. Uh, and to that end, it would be e helpful, I guess, if doctors, for example, were not all from the same background. Um, uh, which again, uh, I know this is a bit of a, a political discussion, but I, I, I think if uh, education costed less, more people would be able to, to, to get that. Yeah, good point. Thank you. And final questions, uh, which is specifically um, uh, addressed to my students. So um, the overwhelming majority of my students are media students, some media production, some other advertising, some other. I've also had the chance to teach to film students and they are the mm, future communicators or they are communicators <laughs> right now uh, as well. So they are in charge of producing content that potentially might reach thousands or millions of people or millions of people. So my final question to you is what kind of practical recommendations um, could you give them uh, when dealing and promoting medical information on mainstream media, on social media? So what can they do to create successful campaigns? But most importantly, what can they do to incorporate the right information when they are dealing with aspects of medical campaign or medical information in general? Well, uh, first of all, read a lot and uh, uh, include in your readings the mainstream information with the one that comes from the experts so that at least you know what they are saying. And then if you decide you, you prefer to trust other sources, okay, but at least you need to know what they're saying. Um, I think, uh, and then fact check everything, fact check everything and decide what the source and whether the sources of what you're reading is trustworthy. I think it would be helpful to read you a list put together by the American Council on Science and Health on how to, uh, uh, to recognize uh, trustworthy information from information that isn't. So how to find out whether your reading is fake news or not? Indeed, and this is uh, related to medical research readings. So first, the article is based on research from a journal that is practically unknown. This is a red flag. Uh, usually, the the, the 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 most important, the more important the journal is, the better. Uh, another red flag: the author makes far-reaching conclusions from a single study. Uh, usually, you need many studies to prove one thing. If you uh, conduct only one study uh, and uh, make a very big claim, this is a bit dodgy. Another red flag, the article makes huge unsupported leaps when describing a particular study's conclusion. So this is a common thing. Uh, a study proves something, but that claims that something else is true. And this is easy for people uh, to believe in these claims because at least part of it was was uh, proved but not the entirety of the of the conclusions drawn by the authors 
Another red flag, the article is from any number of environmentalist health activists or food fed websites. The, uh, I need to give some context to this. It's, yeah, please. <laughs> but but I, I'm not trying to discredit environmentalist websites or anything. But again, when it comes to medical research, the information should, should come from uh, the official bodies first and from uh, accredited institutions like the Lancet, Nature, we were mentioning before, uh, second. Otherwise, um, it can come from any source and uh, claims could be made without any supporting information. That's why health and well-being blogs or websites or associations should act actually have a scientific background upon which build their own recommendations and not vice versa. Like, yeah. It couldn't be just opinion. And also the, the, the trustworthy one, ones, I would say, always remember the readers that this is not medical advice. This is just supporting information. So I think this is important. Good disclaimer to write down. <laughs> Uh, then another red flag, if the article sounds like a press release, science is uh, usually boring to read. And when you unfortunately. try... Unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, but if when you see some uh, paper that is trying to make big claims and big headers, usually it's a bit dodgy. And finally, the final red flag is if the article does not attempt to explain a study's methodology or use technical terminology that would require a level of analysis and understanding. And that's the scientific method. You need the methodology so that the, the experiment can be reproduced. Otherwise, it's just words. Okay. Thank you very much, Marco. And yeah, we're done for today. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> I really enjoyed recording this podcast with you. And yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>